A number of years ago, I had the unique opportunity of being a colleague of Dr. Desmond Ford from the years 1977 to 1979. I was a rookie teacher back then. He was a senior professor. I did a lot more listening than I did talking during those years. And I want you to know that I appreciated Desmond Ford. As I observed him, he was a good Christian scholar. He knew his Bible. He knew the writings of Ellen White, could quote many of them from memory. As I observed his interactions with students, he was always the finest Christian gentleman. I never heard an irritating word. I never heard criticism of any kind. He exemplified the spirit of Christ. And he was a great health reformer, way better than I was during those years. He knew the principles of health. He lived it. And the most important thing, he was very consistent in his theology. He started from his premise and he went directly to his conclusions. He did not practice smorgasbord theology, a little here, a little there, what sounds interesting over here. No, he was consistent. He moved from point A to point B to point C to point D, logically, coherently, and clearly. And that's the most important thing that I appreciated about Desmond Ford. We're going to talk this afternoon about what he taught. What were the actual teachings that he was presenting during those critical years? And again, as I said last night, this is going to be more of a study than a sermon. You have heard a powerful sermon this morning at church. This is a study. Both Pastor Kirkpatrick's messages and mine are more studies than sermons. So here is what he taught. And by the way, I'm taking it from his rather new book, Right with God, Right Now. And uh, it has a subtitle, How God Saves People as Shown in the Bible's Book of Romans. His theme is How to Be Saved. How Salvation Works, the Gospel. So here's how we start, quoting from his book. The bad news in the book of Romans is that every thought we have is defiled. Every emotion of our heart, every tendency of our mind, every inclination of the flesh is tainted in every one of us until the second coming of Jesus and glorification. Sin remains in the Christian until glorification. We've all been selfish. We still are selfish. There's not a single inclination of the heart that isn't tainted by our selfishness even after conversion. Well, I think you can begin to, begin to see his perspective on this subject. I'm not only going to talk about Dr. Ford's theology this afternoon, but some of the legacy that his teachings have brought down the line. Um, Ministry Magazine in the year 2003 republished a, uh, a supplement to Ministry Magazine that went like this. Note the results of Adam's sin insofar as it pertains to us. We were made sinners. We are born in a state of guilt inherited from Adam. We inherit guilt from Adam so that even a baby that dies a day after birth needs a savior though the child never committed a sin of its own. Well, that follows directly in the line of Dr. Ford's understanding of sin. Not only does it follow in that line, it follows in a very strong Christian tradition. John Calvin, in his book, Institutes of the Christian Religion, said this very clearly. All are originally depraved. Guilt is from nature. Even infants bringing their condemnation with them from their mother's womb suffer for their own defect. Men are born vicious. We are all sinners by nature. So this doctrine that Elder Kirkpatrick was talking about, original sin, was first developed in the Roman Catholic Church in the early centuries of Christianity. It came through Protestant Reformation, through both Luther and Calvin. 
and it has come into evangelical Christian thinking around the Christian world today and is now present in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I want you to hear something that was written by someone who is not a Seventh-day Adventist at all and it was written a long time ago in 1945. The author's name is Richard Taylor and the book is entitled A Right Conception of Sin. Listen carefully. The question of sin is so basically related to the nature of God and the plan of redemption it is the one doctrine by which all others can be reduced to their simplest significance. Furthermore it forms the surest and most logical measuring stick by which the accuracy of those doctrines can be detected. The doctrines relating to sin form the center around which we build our entire theological system. Many, perhaps most of the errors which have protruded themselves into Christian theology can be finally traced to a faulty conception of sin. Because someone's notions of sin were a bit off color, his entire trend of reasoning was misdirected. To reason from a false premise is to start an endless chain of false conclusions. Therefore we say that one who does not have correct views of sin is not apt to have correct views of any other fundamental question. This will especially be manifest in regard to his theory of the atonement and God's method of redeeming man. And to insist on correct views of sin is to make it impossible to stray very far from essential truth. Amazing statement. From outside Adventism. And yet, I believe, as clear and as carefully stated as we can ever see in print. So the first point of Dr. Ford's theology is that we are sinners by nature. That sin is built into us from our very birth. The doctrine of original sin. Alright? Point number two. This is from his statements in the very unique and special Palmdale Conferences on Righteousness by Faith that took place in the mid-70s. For Christ to be the second or last Adam, he must possess a sinless human nature. To teach that Christ was possessed of sinful propensities is to teach that he himself was a sinner in need of a savior. And of course you can see how that follows. If sin is by nature, if Christ is sinless, then he cannot have our nature. It's just as simple as that. It is very consistent and is very logical. So, on this point, again, I'm going to go back to the, um, the um, ministry magazine of the year 2003. It is clear that Jesus was born and came to this earth under entirely unique circumstances, different from ours, and therefore received a one-of-a-kind nature. His nature is and was completely sinless. His nature. In that same ministry supplement, we are told that Christ did not inherit at birth the fallen nature inherited by Adam's posterity. If Christ had inherited the evil nature earned by Adam's fall, he too would have been born in sin, under condemnation, and therefore himself in need of a savior. He did not have that within his nature that predisposed him toward sinning. He did not possess the passions and inner promptings which we are daily obliged to submit by the grace of God. And so Ministry Magazine in that edition followed directly in the line of Desmond Ford's understanding of why Christ could not have our fallen nature. Because if he did, he would be a sinner in need of a savior. And so point number two is very clear in Dr. Ford's theology and in our modern understanding. Christ cannot be tempted from within. Christ cannot have any pulls from within to pull him toward the things we are pulled to from within our nature or he would have been a sinner himself in need of a savior. That's point number two. Now, what did Dr. Ford teach about justification? The word justify 
It never means, it never means to make righteous inside. It means strictly to count righteous. The whole of true religion revolves around this issue. Justification is over you all the time like the sun. Now why did he say that? Why do we need justification over us all the time like the sun? Because we are sinning all the time. So we need constant justification for constant sin. Again, his theology is consistent from point A to B to C. In Ford's view, the new birth, which we all understand to be very basic to salvation, is the result of salvation, not the cause of salvation. We are saved by accepting Christ and being justified and after that, sometime after that, we are born again. The new birth is a result of salvation, not a cause of salvation. He said, justification has to do with your status. Sanctification with your state. Your status is always the same in Christ, perfect. Your state is up and down, in and out, a mess. One, your, stat, your state is, I'm sorry, let's get this right. Your status, justification, is based on what Christ did for me. The other, sanctification, is based on what Christ does in me. The first, justification, is perfect, complete, and 100%. The second, sanctification, isn't complete and 100% because God is doing it in me. The Christian message is Christ for me, what Christ has already done. The Christian life is Christ in me, what happens after conversion. Now that's pretty complicated, all of those status and state things. And you know what it really boils down to? Justification is yours even when your life is a mess. In and out, up and down, sanctification isn't working very well, but you've been justified. You've been saved. You are right with Christ as long as you're justified. For Dr. Ford again, the gospel is justification alone and justification declared. Not experienced. Not the new birth. It is always over us because we are already always sinning. And of course, Romans 7 is referenced. You know Romans 7. The good that I would, I do not. And that which I would not, that I do. In the gospel, he says, there is no condemnation even when we fail to meet God's standards. Romans 8 is not about a person different from the one found in Romans 7. It's wrong when people say we need to get out of Romans 7 and into Romans 8. In other words, Romans 7, the good that I would, is the normal Christian experience. That's the only experience we can have. We're not condemned even when we're sold under sin. That's what Romans 7 says. I am carnal, sold under sin. But as long as we've been justified, we are not condemned. So in summary, these are his major points. Justification is only a legal declaration in heaven where the righteousness of Christ is counted for you, written down for you. Justification is God declaring us righteous, not making us righteous. Justification is always over us like the sun, like an umbrella, even when we're sinning, knowingly sinning. Our salvation is assured when we are sinning as long as we believe in Jesus. The new birth is the result of justification and the transforming work of the Holy Spirit is excluded from salvation, from justification. The view that justification is the new birth and an inner transformation is Roman Catholic theology in his perspective. Sanctification is not by faith alone. Only justification is by faith alone. Sanctification is the result of justification and it is faith plus human effort. Therefore, it's not part of the saving work of justification. The law of God, these are all summaries of his theology. The law of God cannot be perfectly obeyed even by those who are converted because everything the believer does is tinged with sin. The believer is sinning all the time. 
Justification is a legal umbrella over the sinner, ensuring his salvation despite sins in his life. We are not condemned even when we fail to reach God's standard. And the example that is used is David, who did not lose his salvation when he fell so tragically. And remember, David's sins were adultery and murder. And he did not lose his salvation because that's part of sanctification, not justification. So that's a brief summary of Desmond Ford's teaching on justification. And that was his primary message when he was at Pacific Union College. That was he, that's what he was talking about most of the time. He was concerned about that particular issue much more than any other issue. And uh, those were the things that he was stressing. Now, what does that mean in terms of preparation for the end of time? Let me share with you his perspective on that. You all are familiar, if you've listened to Adventist uh, history for the past years, that Dr. Ford did not believe that there was any change in the heavenly sanctuary ministry of Jesus Christ in the year 1844. That there was no movement from the holy place to the most holy place in a judgment cleansing ministry at that time. Why did he say that? Basically, it is his gospel premise that forced him to reject the pre-advent judgment beginning in 1844. Here is what he says. We were all in Adam and Eve when they sinned. By the sin of one, condemnation came on all of us. We were born dead. Sin does remain. There is residual sin in our lives. Since sin is as constant as breathing, we can never live without sin or even hope to stand without sin in a judgment. So the only thing God needs to know is have you accepted Christ and been justified? Not how are you living, not how is your experience, but have you accepted Christ? Therefore, the pre-advent judgment has no relevance. His rejection of the judgment was based on his premise of the gospel and what he believed the gospel to really be teaching. And you know what? That legacy has come down to our time as well. Again, from um, um, Ministry Magazine uh, in this particular uh, time. Note the results of Adam's sin insofar as it pertains to us. We were made sinners. We are sinners because of that. Sinners, and note, notice carefully now, salvation by grace and the merits of Christ's atonement still avails for the saints after probation closes. Saving grace is available at any time in the Christian life until the day of our Lord's coming. Sinners are the only persons with whom saving grace is concerned. There is no evidence anywhere in scripture or in the spirit of prophecy that indicates the slightest change in salvation by grace ministered daily to the saints. We need to grasp the biblical doctrine of salvation by grace beyond the close of probation. If he is under grace, then it is because he is not yet sinless. What have we just heard there? We're going to need God's forgiving grace right up until the second coming of Christ. After the close of probation, forgiving grace is still available. Christ continues to forgive us of our sins right up until the second coming of Christ. That's what this statement is saying. So at this point, we have four issues, don't we? We're born sinners. The traditional Christian understanding of sin. Jesus Christ could not take our nature. Again, traditional Christian understanding. Justification is declared only traditional Christian understanding. And we will sin until Jesus comes. All four of those are orthodox Christian doctrines right now. And Dr. Ford was teaching all of them. And they have come into the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the various ways I've expressed at this point. Now I'm going to focus on one area that uh, has been rather tricky in the last 20 years. In the early 1980s, there were vigorous debates in our magazines about the issues that we're talking about. Norman Gully wrote about the pre-fall and post-fall views of Jesus Christ as our Savior. Was he born with Adam's nature or was he born with ours? He says, both views are found within Scripture and in the writings of Ellen White. He was like the first Adam, 
or like that which the redeemed will be when changed at the second advent. He took that weak and deteriorated sin-affected nature but without taking its propensities or taint of sin predisposing to a leaning to sin. He had a pre-fall and a post-fall nature combined in a unique way. So now we come to a new twist. Questions on doctrine talked about Christ not having any part of a fallen nature. Now we're hearing he had both a pre-fall nature and a post-fall nature. What is happening here? And so at this point we need to go a little farther into our understanding of what is happening here. Norman Gully again, it was fallen, his nature, in being deprived like ours, but unfallen in not being depraved like ours. Catch the terms? They require a whole theological arsenal to, pick, to unpack those and understand what is meant by each one of them and why they are important. And so we've got to take a little bit of a look at this. As was mentioned a little bit earlier, um, questions on doctrine has had a rough time uh, getting through the logical apparatus of most of the followers of uh, Seventh-day Adventists in recent years. And during the last couple of decades, there's been a refinement of the questions on doctrine position on the nature of Christ since it's been very well recognized, even by those who support questions on doctrine, that it... Uh, misrepresented quite a few of the Ellen White statements. And so we come to another individual that hardly any Seventh-day Adventist has ever heard about. His name was Henry Melville. He was a very popular Anglican clergyman of the 19th century. And uh, it becomes very interesting as we look back and see how he has influenced uh, what we have been teaching. In Ministry Magazine of December 1989, Tim Poiret studied Melville's sermon, The Humiliation of the Man Christ Jesus. That was by Melville in the 19th century. And Poirier commented, Ellen White drew extensively from this sermon for her article entitled Christ, Man's Example. In other words, she took material from Henry Melville's sermon and incorporated it into one of her presentations. Again, remembering that inspired writers can do that because God is, in, is directing part of that process. In this sermon, Melville digresses. Now, what's a digression? Not part of his main argument, not part of his main theme, but a little side note. In this sermon, Melville digresses to consider the question of Christ's humanity. So now he's going to look at Christ and how he was as a human being. And here is what he said in his famous digression. There were consequences of the fall. We divide these consequences into innocent infirmities and sinful propensities. Now Christ took humanity with the innocent infirmities. He derived humanity from his mother. Like her, he could hunger and thirst and weep and mourn and writhe and die. But whilst he took humanity with the innocent infirmities, he did not take it with the sinful propensities. Here, deity interposed. The Holy, the Holy Ghost overshadowed the Virgin and allowing weaknesses to be derived from her forbade wickedness and so caused that there should be generated a sorrowing and a suffering humanity but nevertheless an undefiled and a spotless. A humanity with tears but not with stains. Accessible to anguish but not prone to offend. So Melville's answer to the question of how Christ was born, divine intervention. The Holy Spirit kept some attributes of heredity from coming through from Mary to Jesus while allowing other innocent infirmities to come through the hereditary process. It's an interesting side note here that Roman Catholicism also teaches divine intervention. They do it in a slightly different way. They say Mary was immaculately conceived so that there was nothing that could come through heredity to Jesus. In both cases it's the same problem. If we're born sinners then Christ can't have our nature in both the Catholic and the Protestant version. Again this is from Melville. So we hold 
And we give it to you as to what we believe the orthodox doctrine to be, that Christ's humanity was not the Adamic humanity, that is, the humanity of Adam before the fall, nor fallen humanity, that is, in every respect, the humanity of Adam after the fall. It was not the Adamic because it had the innocent infirmities of the fallen. Made of a woman, Christ de derived all from his mother that we derive except sinfulness. And this he derived not, because deity in the person of the Holy Ghost interposed between the child and the pollution of the parent. So there we are. Henry Melville, famous sermon. Ellen White uses part of that sermon. And believe it or not, that understanding of the nature of Christ has become the dominant view within the Seventh-day Adventist Church today. Uh, George Knight, uh, writing in his annotated edition of Questions on Doctrine, says, Melville held that the incarnate Christ was neither just like Adam before the fall nor just like huma fallen humanity since the entrance of sin. That appears to be the position Ellen White held. Melville's model is the only one that can explain all of Ellen White's statements on the human nature of Christ. End of discussion, apparently. So, the Melville Anglican Orthodox view of the incarnation of Jesus Christ has become the standard teaching method today in the Seventh-day Adventist Church about Christ's nature. Couple of problems. Yes, Ellen White did use Melville's sermon, adapting parts of it into her presentation on Jesus Christ. But it is enormously significant that Ellen White did not borrow one single statement from this famous digression that we're talking about. Even Poiret admits this. We have not found that Ellen White directly borrowed any material from this digression. Now since there was extensive borrowing from the sermon, this failure to find one reference where Ellen White borrowed from the digression would indicate to me that Melville's conclusion in this digression were rejected by Ellen White, not accepted by Ellen White. Why didn't Ellen White quote from the digression if it was her view, her understanding of the nature that Christ assumed in the incarnation? She ignored it, which says to me she rejected it. And we've got to come to grips with some of these issues. In all of these teachings of the Incarnation, there's a key component, one single bottom line, that makes it clear that Christ did not receive our fallen tendencies and the pressures of our nature. The word is divine intervention, which another phrase for that is exempt, which was the phrase used in Questions on Doctrine. Divine intervention. Because, you see, every child born to Adam and Eve, and that includes everyone here, gets a fallen nature. Complete. No parts missing. We get the bad tendencies. We get the bad promptings. We get the bad pulls, as well as the innocent infirmities. So heredity is a, is a total package for us. Every child. There is no exception to this in all of human history unless... We're talking about some divine intervention in Jesus Christ. And you see, once again, the Roman Catholic doctrine of the Immaculate Conception is not really about Mary, although it came to be about Mary. It's really about protecting Christ from Adam's sin. That's why the Roman Catholic Church devised the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. And in formulating what Melville calls the Orthodox doctrine, he again declares the birth of Christ to be a divine intervention which preserved him free from the fallen nature of man. The Roman Catholic view used the term stain of original sin that Christ was protected from. Melville used the words wickedness and pollution that Christ was protected from. So once again, it is the same doctrine. It's the same doctrine that Augustine developed, modified, uh, tweaked, developed, and now has become very popular even within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I think it's important here, as I kind of, I'm not going to spend much more time on this. I think it's important to understand here 
that the new understandings that have come to bear original sin, Christ's sinless nature, justification declared, sinning until the second coming of Christ, have no true atonement phase with Jesus in the most holy place preparing us for the seal of God. All it has is Jesus in the holy place ministering the benefits of the completed atonement on Calvary. This new understanding of the gospel has a truncated great controversy concept, one which is not con uh, concerned to discover or cares to explain any reason for the delay of Christ. Well, we just haven't gotten that far in the clock countdown yet, and we don't know why, is basically what we're talking about here. In spite of the fact that inspiration tells us exactly why we're still here waiting for the second coming of Christ. He's awaiting a final demonstration in God's people of the power of the gospel to change them completely to the point where they can stand before God without fault. Listen to just a couple of statements from Ellen White. Early writings, page 71. Are we seeking for his fullness, ever pressing toward the mark set before us, the perfection of his character? When the Lord's people reach this mark, they will be sealed in their foreheads. Filled with the Spirit, they will be complete in Christ, and the recording angel will declare, it is finished. Notice the progression there. Filled with his fullness. Perfection of character. When the Lord's people reach this mark, they are sealed in their foreheads, filled with the Spirit, complete in Christ. It is finished. One step leading to the next step. Selected Messages, Volume 3, page 360. He who has not sufficient faith in Christ to believe that he can keep him from sinning has not the faith that will give him an entrance into the kingdom of God. Do we believe God's word? is what she is asking. If we don't believe the impossible promises, the seemingly impossible promises, do we have enough faith that will allow us an entrance into God's kingdom? Review and Herald, March 14, 1912. Now, while our great high priest is making the atonement for us, we should seek to become perfect in Christ. Not even by a thought could our Savior be brought to yield to the power of temptation. There was no sin in him that Satan could use to his advantage. This is the condition in which those must be found who shall stand in the time of trouble. It couldn't be any clearer than that, could it? We know what the experience of Christ was for 33 years. Not even by a thought. Could our Savior be brought to yield? And of course that means a chosen thought, a cherished thought. Not even by a thought. We all believe, and rightly so, that God wins. That Christ ultimately wins in the end because of two things, not just one. Because of what he did while he was on this earth. And because of what he does through his people in the earth's last generation. Because of those two things, he wins. Jesus is always at the center. He is the author and the finisher. He's the focus of the last generation and of the whole universe as he is vindicated in his faithful followers. Name anyone you want, Enoch or Job or Moses or Elijah or John the Baptist and even Jesus. All of them were more interested in vindicating the character of God than in saving their own lives. That was not their concern. They were willing to give up their own salvation in order to save others and prove God right in the great controversy. And this is to be the experience of the last generation. They are more interested in vindicating God's name and his character than even in having their own names in the book of life. Revelation portrays a people who give glory to God in their witness and their works and their life and their character and God is vindicated by his faithful people at the end. Great Controversy, page 425. While the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of purification, of putting away of sin among God's people upon earth. When this work shall have been accomplished, the followers of Christ will be ready for his appearing. Once again, the terms are so clear. When this work shall have been accomplished, then Christ will come. And what's the work? A special work of purification, of putting away of sin. 
When is it performed? While Christ is making intercession in the heavenly sanctuary, while the atonement is taking place. Desire of Ages, page 671, and this one is so important. The very image of God is to be reproduced in humanity. The honor of God, the honor of Christ, is involved in the perfection of the character of his people. What's at stake here is not my salvation. What's at stake here is God's credibility. Can he pull this one off? From every historical evidence and from everything that Satan is challenging, this is too big even for God to bring about a people like this that can stand without sin after the close of probation with no mediator in the heavenly courts. The honor of God, the honor of Christ is involved in the perfection of the character of his people. Could it be written any more plainly? If he can do that, he wins the great controversy. If he can't do that, Satan wins the great controversy. That's why there is a close of probation. Who's telling the truth? God or Satan. And that's where this all comes down to and where we are. You see, Satan can make the claim that Jesus, being both God and human, had some sort of advantage over us because he was both. Satan could say Jesus is the only one who could keep God's law. What do you expect? After all, he was both God and man. That's a very logical argument. And the only answer is for God to produce a whole generation of human beings that are 100% human who also can keep God's law because of Jesus living in them. That's God's answer to Satan's charge. Our God is not in the business of leaving any questions unanswered in the great controversy. He's going to meet every possible objection that Satan can bring up. And he will not and cannot bring the great controversy to an end until all the questions are satisfactorily answered. No room for doubts for the rest of eternity about what God can do and what the gospel can accomplish. Nor about his power to give sinful human beings the ability to be in total harmony with him. By the way, the word atonement really means at one meant. At one with God in everything. Which now brings us to the last generation. Satan has been marshalling all the deceptive powers of evil to hurl at God's last generation people. He is pulling out all the stops in his endeavor to cause God's people to miss the mark, to fall short, to let down, on the other hand, God has unleashed the power of vital truths recovered. And I hope and pray that's what's happening this weekend. Reactivation of the gift of prophecy as a special guiding light to this remnant people. The promise of divine aid, all to enable his people in this last momentous conflict to come off more than conquerors. God's people will bring glory to God by demonstrating his redeeming power in their lives. When Satan threw everything he could at Job, God was proven right. When Satan throws everything at the last generation that he can devise, God will again be proven right before men and angels. Satan will be allowed to give it his best shot of 6,000 years of deception. And he will fail miserably. Like Job, the last generation vindicates God's claims and his character. God will prove that he can empower a whole generation of faithful saints and prove that he can keep them from falling and to present them faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. That's what God is wanting to do in this final generation. And I'm going to just pull this together with a final thought or two. By accepting the evangelical doctrine that the atonement was completed at the cross and that Jesus was born with the sinless human nature of Adam before the fall or a half-fallen nature, either way, most of our church pulpits no longer tell us that Jesus is our example in overcoming all temptation and sin.
Therefore the sanctuary message is no longer relevant. The warning messages of the three angels of Revelation 14 are no longer relevant to God's plan of salvation. We can be saved in our sins. Character development is no longer necessary. The commandments of God cannot be kept perfectly even with the power of the Holy Spirit. The spirit of prophecy is an irrelevant antique of the 19th century and the seventh day Sabbath is not kept according to Isaiah 58.13. All of these consequences of believing an evangelical understanding of the gospel. William Johnson, former editor of the Adventist Review, shared a powerful story in one of his editorials. Dr. Paul Brand, who pioneered restorative surgery for lepers, tells of an epidemic of measles that struck Vellore in South India, where the Brand family was then living. The Brands had an infant daughter, Estelle, and because of her age, she was exposed to high risk. The pediatrician explained that convalescent serum, serum from a person who had contracted measles and had overcome it, would protect the little girl. Word went around Velour that the brands needed the blood of an overcomer. It was no use finding somebody who had conquered chickenpox or had recovered from a broken leg. Such people, albeit healthy, could not give the specific help we needed to overcome measles. We needed someone who had experienced measles and had defeated that disease, writes Brand in his book. The Brands located such a person, took out some of his blood, and injected their daughter with the convalescent serum. Armed with the borrowed antibodies, their daughter fought off the invading disease. The injected serum gave her body time to manufacture her own antibodies. Estelle overcame measles, not by her own body strength, but as the result of a battle that had taken place previously within someone else. What an illustration. I've never seen a better illustration of why Jesus had to come in our fallen nature to provide us the antibodies that we need to fight off the disease of sin. And believe it or not, this illustration comes from an editor who believes that Christ had an unfallen nature. I think that's the most amazing part of this little story. <laughs> My friends, the issue of Christ's human nature is not going away anytime soon because the whole plan of salvation is at stake here. Hebrews 1, 14 and 15 tells us that through death, Jesus would destroy him that had the power of death and would deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And verse 17 tells us that the only way Christ could do this was to be made like unto his brethren. Not in some things, but in all things. Inspiration further tells us the great work of redemption could be carried out only by the Redeemer taking the place of fallen Adam. That's Review and Herald, February 24, 1874. It could not be accomplished if Christ took unfallen Adam's place or if he took no one's place, which is partially like Adam and partially like us. There doesn't exist that person. To be our sinless substitute, he had to overcome the liabilities of our fallen nature. What had become an irresistible force to man, Christ must make a conquered power. Now even though st this statement from our Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary is not inspired, it shows a deep understanding of Christ's redemptive act. Quote, Christ met, overcame, and condemned sin in the sphere in which it had previously exercised its dominion and mastery. The flesh, the scene of sin's former triumphs, now became the scene of its defeat and expulsion. Our nature is the problem. And Christ came to destroy the sphere in which Satan held dominion, our fallen nature. So the issue of the incarnation was very simple. Could God really overcome sin in Satan's ultimate stronghold, the fallen human heart? If human weaknesses and desires could be subject to God's law, then Satan would lose his greatest battle and the great controversy would be truly decided. But if God would exempt his son from some human tendencies, would the great controversy be any closer to fulfillment than when Adam walked out of the Garden of Eden? When Jesus prevailed on the cross, 
A loud voice was heard in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down. Do we really want to rob Jesus of his great victory under the guise of making him our, quote, sinless substitute? Will we continue to deny him the full salvation that he wrought not only over acts of sin but over fallen, weak, sinful human nature? Let us allow Christ to truly be our sinless substitute as well as our holy example. Only the real Christ providing a real atonement can lead his church through to final victory. That's why I believe that the subject of the nature of Christ is really important.